I was just catching up on my lymphoma clinical trials, which is near and dear to my heart because I have a fondness for lymphoma. And I saw a discussion on social media that just created a lot of controversy and firestorms. And I thought it'd be really interesting to unpack some of the arguments here. So lymphoma, what do you need to know about it? Well, I think one of the things you have to know about lymphoma, particularly large cell lymphoma, is that the history is one of the most fascinating parts of medical oncology. I won't go through the whole history. I think I've done that before in some other lectures, but I will just talk about one part of the history. I think in the 1980s and 1990s, the enthusiasm for regimens beyond CHOP was incredible. We wanted to move beyond CHOP and we wanted to try different combinations of multidrug chemotherapy regimens in the hopes that we could cure a higher fraction of patients. After all, who wouldn't want that? And indeed, they were really exceptional, single center, selected, uncontrolled reports of really good outcomes from multidrug combination regimens. If you gave something like, say, promacytobam, you'd have a higher CR rate and a higher rate of disease-free survival three years down the road. You'd even have a higher overall survival compared to historical controls. Now, one of the things people knew at this time, we've known this since the early 1980s, is that historically controlled studies, or in other words, if I took 50 people now and I treat them and I compare them to 50 people from ages past, historical control studies often look positive when randomized control trials on the exact same question are later found to be negative. And this was a great example. In a seminal 1993 paper by Rick Fisher and colleagues, they actually randomized people to CHOP and three other multidrug combination chemotherapy regimens. And the hope was, of course, that one or both or many of these or all three would beat CHOP and have a higher CR rate, a higher DFS, a better OS. But of course, the curves were famously superimposable. The time to treatment failure was the same. The overall survival was the same. They were all essentially the same. And CHOP won. It remained the standard of care because it was less toxic and less cumbersome than all these alternatives. Well, that lesson of lymphoma, that lesson that was captured in that 93 Rick Fisher paper, was never fully heeded. And that has been one of the great and most interesting things about medical oncology to me, particularly lymphoma, but even more broadly, is that even when we've been burned with single center experience that looks really good in historical controlled fashion, that that doesn't replicate in randomized controlled trials, we still continue to make that error over and over again. Enter dose adjusted our epoch. I think many people thought that taking the drugs in epoch, the Oncovin, the anthracycline, the etoposide, and running it over a continuous infusion over several days would have better delivery to the cancer cell and better pharmacologic properties that result in more cancer killing. And dose-adjusted REPOC is rather elegantly designed, I must admit. Having that cytoxin on day five, having the dose adjustment so you change the level of the dose until you achieve the neutrophil nadir that you so desire to really kind of push the body to achieve the maximum really sort of tolerated dose or safely tolerated dose of these drugs, I think it's a very elegant strategy. And it was incredibly plausible that dose-adjusted our epoch would be superior to CHOP. But again, we just have to remember history. People in the past, very bright people, thought that, but they failed to show that in a randomized controlled trial. Enter the CLGB study 50303 by Nancy Bartlett and Wyndham Wilson, which was a randomized controlled trial that sought to test this. It sought to test dose-adjusted our epoch against our CHOP, which is the standard of care at the time of the study. And it, I think, accrued patients up until... I don't know, 2013. And I remember distinctly December 2016 at ASH when the results of this study were presented. And it was found that dose adjusted our epoch simply failed. It failed to beat our CHOP, which remained the standard of care for patients with DLBCL. It couldn't win. And again, it fits the history of DLBCL. There are many times in history we thought we could improve upon CHOP and we couldn't do so in randomized fashion. It also once again reaffirms the value of randomized control trials in this disease. In fact, I would go so far as to say that one of the, the brilliant strategies in DLBCL was to keep fragmenting it into smaller and smaller slivers so that you could pull out your double hits, you could pull out your PMBLs, you could pull out, you know, double expressor for some time, and you can say, you know, now we're getting into a smaller cohort, we can't do a randomized study, but let's just go ahead and treat these patients differently. And in fact, to some large degree, we do that to this day in PMBL and in double hit a lot of people are giving EPOC or other such regimens. They don't have randomized data showing it's superior. And in fact, if they actually did randomized trials and just in those cohorts, I would have some doubts if it could beat our CHOP. But, you know, we don't know. It's fair to say that I think it's well accepted that you can use dosage of our EPOC, at least in the PMBL and the double hit cohort or the McRearrange cohort.
But when it comes to DLBCL NOS, I think our CHOP is the standard of care. You could even argue that in some of these diseases, you've never proven dosage of Staripec is superior, but when it comes to NOS, it is the standard of care. Enter the recent controversy. It was a phase one dose escalation study that accrued after the 2016 ASH. It accrued in 2017, 2018, and 2019, and it took people in phase one. There's no randomization. It gave them all dose-adjusted our epoch with venetoclax was the phase one portion. And we're trying to find out how we can safely combine venetoclax with that dose-adjusted our epoch. Makes sense. And right now, there are ongoing randomized efforts to try to add venetoclax to epoch backbone in a cooperative group study in the double-hit cohort. I think that would have been better to actually just test if our CHOP is as good as our epoch or if our epoch is better than our CHOP in the double-hit cohort because these retrospective analyses are rather um, low levels of credibility, but it is what it is. They're, they're doing it for that purpose. But one of the most interesting facts that got pulled out of this debate was I think found by Aaron Goodman and he highlighted it on Twitter, which was that at least some, at least maybe about 9, 10, or 11 patients on this phase 1 study, maybe about a third of the patients on the phase 1 study, they didn't have double-hit lymphoma. They had DLBCLNOS, and they were untreated, and they were placed on a phase one study of our epoch plus venetoclax. Ooh, that's interesting. Because what you've done in this, in this little study, is you've taken some people who would have been perfectly happy and done perfectly well with our CHOP, which is the standard of care for them, and you've given them a different backbone on which you're adding your dose escalation phase one study. And the backbone you've given is just more toxic. So one might argue from a research ethics standpoint that the trial is actually quite problematic. If it had just included double hits or MIC rearrangements, it might be justified on the basis of standard of care, although that standard of care is not based on randomized data. It might be justified just because that's what people do. But to include this group, what you're doing is you're ensuring that many people who would have been treated with a less intense and less toxic regimen now receive a more intense and more toxic regimen and even more cumbersome because, of course, our epoch is a continuous infusion. It is cumbersome. It's much more cumbersome than our CHOP. So Aaron Goodman pointed this out, and I think he kind of subtly suggested that there might be some ethical questions here. Um, but I think it's a good question, actually. And it's one of many such questions I have, and it's going to become very relevant because there's some FDA draft guidance that is going to kind of play on who, in whom can we do phase one clinical trials? And if you want to read more about that FDA draft guidance, check out the paper by Mark Lithgow and I in Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology. It is now changing some of the rules of the game around clinical trials and allowing us to take untreated people with highly curable malignancies and putting them on phase one dose escalation studies. Anyway, read that article. But back to this question. You've taken people who would have done just great with our CHOP and given them something more toxic and had your little dose escalation. That makes it easier to accrue your phase one, no doubt about it. But it is arguably, I think, unjust for those people who are getting some backbone that is just going to add toxicity and in a randomized control trial has never proven superiority over the standard of care RCHOP. So I think it is a questionable design feature. And this was getting discussed on Twitter. I think some of the fair points were, you know, is this acceptable, not acceptable? Is this just because we're interpreting it through the retrospective scope? And I think that's not true because I remember where I was in that ash in 2016. And when I saw those Kaplan-Meier curves, I was like, it is over for all comers, DLBCL and Epoch. It is over. There's no other way around it. You know, it's over. Epoch is uh, failed and it's failed to beat the standard of care. So it has to prove it's better than the standard of care before I revisit it, at least in all comers. So Aaron's point is good. The reaction was swift, and it was very predictable because I've been there. I've been there in 2016 and 17 when I was hammering on some different studies. And the reaction is, you know, who are you to comment? You're not a trialist. But I do think that Dr. Goodman is, in fact, a trialist in the sense that he does participate and run clinical trials. But somebody said, like, you know, until you are, you know, the PI on a clinical study, you know, you can't, you can't talk about it or you can't comment. And that to me is just a perennial um, excuse I hear on social media. And it is a really weak argument. And I want to talk about that for a minute. Imagine if somebody went to the movies, Roger Ebert, Gene Siskel, and they said, you know, we like this movie, we'll give it two thumbs up. But then they said, you know what? Until you actually make a $200 million blockbuster film, you can't judge this movie. Imagine if somebody went into a restaurant and they tried the soup at a restaurant and they'd spent 20 years as a, as a 
restaurant critic for the New York Times. And then they were told, you know what? Until you open your own soup kitchen and run your own soup restaurant, you can't really comment about our restaurant. Imagine somebody had a beer and they went to rate it on one of these apps where you can rate a good beer. And they said, you know what? Until you brew your own beer, you can't rate this. I think we would all agree that such a policy that one cannot judge something until one actually constructs that thing themselves, that would be a misguided and foolish and defeating strategy, and it's not a rule we adhere to in any space of our lives, especially with randomized controlled trials and clinical trials in general. It is, of course, going to be the case that the most accurate and damning criticism of clinical studies does not come from people who themselves are participating in the recurrent reputation game of running the clinical studies. Allow me to explain that for a second. If you are going to want to run these studies, you got to play ball with these companies. You can't be seen as being very sharp and critical of these companies. And if you want to be critical of these companies, they're not going to want you to be running the studies. So you have to bite your tongue if you want to run the studies. And so what they're really saying is, is that no one can ever criticize these studies because if you criticize the studies, they won't let you run them. I think there's another thing. Of course, you will learn things by participating in clinical studies. You'll learn things by writing or by copy pasting a protocol. I mean, writing a protocol, not copy pasting a protocol, writing a protocol, obviously from scratch. You learn things by doing that. You learn things by drafting a proposal for a study. You learn things by trying to get the study through the arcane and bureaucratic processes that governs clinical studies. Of course, you learn many things. You learn many things when you actually enroll people on studies and you see how you have to handle you know, if there is something that comes up, how should that be written in the protocol? How should be that navigated? What if the protocol doesn't specify? How do you negotiate those things? Who is more protocol compliant than someone else? You learn so many things. But at the core of a study is not some esoterica. It is a fundamental clinical question, which is, who are the people that need EPOC? Who are the people that need ARCHOP? Who are the people that benefit from Venetoclax? These are very simple questions. And all of us who are interested in cancer from patients to doctors to caregivers, we're all committed to knowing the answer to these questions. And the clinical studies are simple experimental designs that should shed light on these questions. And so you shouldn't have to do all these things to be able to quickly see that the POLO trial is a very silly study, as I describe in a prior video. I'll put the link below. It's a silly study because you took people who you shouldn't have halted the chemotherapy on, you halted them, and you randomized them to a costly, expensive drug or sugar pill, which no one would ever do. So you're literally harming the control arm. They're getting harmed because they're getting something beneath the standard of care. This phase one study is something that is harming these people. They're harmed because there are toxicities in this study and you can read about them and they're not so good. And that happened in the backdrop of many people getting a type of therapy that is simply inappropriate because it failed to improve upon CHOP. It's more toxic, it's more cumbersome. So no one would want to do that in real life. That's the backbone. It furthers the interest of the company. Sure, I get that. And you've got to have a reputational game with the company if you want them to come back to you the next day. I get that. But it is not a good study for those at least 9 to 11 people who probably didn't need EPOC. Um, and certainly it's not justified in. So I find it really problematic. And it's really, what's the goal of this kind of criticism? It's because they want this guy to be quiet. You know, that's the goal. It's not a real scientific or academic criticism. It's the goal is that, you know what, Aaron? Let's turn the volume down on you. We're going to discredit you by alleging that you yourself don't have the requisite experience to even comment on this issue. When in fact, the comment you've made is actually incredibly to the heart of the matter and very, very astute and wise. And actually, we probably need to reflect on it as a profession because it speaks to some of the deep failings in this profession, the core root rot of this profession, which is that... The easiest way to have a very successful career is to play ball with the companies that are making tremendous amounts of money off cancer medicine while offering products that offer very marginal to modest de deltas in idealized circumstances that may not offer those benefits in average patient populations. I describe that, of course, in the book Malignant. So I found this to be gr very interesting in so many ways. One, because it feels a little bit different to not be in the hot seat yourself. It wasn't me this time. It was somebody else. I wasn't even a part of it. I just stayed out of it. And it was so predictable because I'd lived it before. I felt like I was Aaron Goodman. Aaron Goodman is me reincarnated from a few years ago because I had the exact same arguments about different clinical trials with some of the exact same points. And I think it's a telling. I think that the senior trialists making those statements will chill the atmosphere for junior people to comment. 
I think that um, the trial is problematic, exactly as he describes. I think that if you extrapolate it, there is a general principle here, which is every single phase one study done in a population where there are very good treatment options has to ensure that that phase one study cannot possibly erode the treatment options in that, in that space. So when you have something like that's very curative, like testicle cancer, or a lymph, large cell lymphoma, or Hodgkin's lymphoma, you got to tread very lightly with your phase one study because it's possible. In fact, it might even be under most circumstances probable that you increase toxicity and erode outcomes without benefiting people. Maybe what we actually need is a reconceptualization. I just had a really good idea. I'm not going to say it now because maybe I'll try to get somebody to help me write that up. Um, an idea of how you could do phase one studies in this space in a more ethical and safe manner. It's different than the traditional phase one study in oncology. I think we need to point that out as well. The traditional phase one studies in somebody who's exhausted all prior treatment options and thus one would contend Although they could suffer deleterious effects from the drug, it will be carefully monitored. And there is, you know, the therapeutic benefit is not zero. Of course, the misconception is that it's very great, but it's not zero. And we know from that famous paper by Chris Grady and colleagues that is about 4% response rate in phase ones unselected for many years ago. We know in a paper that I did with Derek Tao and Audrey Tran um, that in a pooled analysis in different ways you pool it, maybe we're talking about a 5% response rate um, in phase one trials. And this like, salvage exhausted other treatment option setting but when you start moving it into the frontline setting into patient populations that actually do fare well from standard of care therapies it introduces a whole number of additional ethical concerns and i think aaron's right there needs to be something something in this space that will harmonize this and give us some guidance i just had a good idea of a way you could actually protect participants a little bit better but that said the chilling effect is when people make it seem like you can't talk about it and I strongly and vehemently disagree with that. So, this is a video much more close to my roots, my favorite things in life, which is oncology clinical trials and the way in which they're manipulated to further corporate interests and not benefit patients. Do you like this video? You're gonna get some more of this on this channel in the months to come. You know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message, leave a message below. Um, we're gonna put this on the podcast on plenarysession.com. Until next time.